Let's start off, and I, you know, when I, I grew up in church and, and all this stuff, and a lot of people know that already, but when I was about 13 years old, there was, uh, there was a group in our church uh, that was kind of head up by a, a man that was in the church, and he was into lifting weights and all this other stuff, and you know, a bunch of teenage boys, you know, you start talking about lifting weights, and all of a sudden they get, uh, they get images in their mind like they can be the next Arnold Schwarzenegger, right, or something like that. Some of you grown men are out there going, oh yeah, I'm still that way, you know. You know, and I remember that the, the point that I was told as a 13-year-old, what the point for this group was so that we could encourage brotherhood within the church. We could get together, encourage one another, challenge one another, get healthy, yes, but it was more for unity and encouragement. And I, and I remember thinking at 13, that's great. I'd love to, to go hang out with a bunch of other guys and we can lift weights and we can you know, grow closer together and we can be friends and all this. And there was a, a, a member of my family who was out of church at that time who claimed to be a believer, but he was out of church, he was, in, he was involved in things in his life and sin, and I thought, man, this, this may be a good way to get him back in church. So I went up to this man who was heading up this uh, workout crew thing, and I told him, I said, hey, this would be good for this person in my family, can, can we get him to come? And I'll never forget, he looked at me and said, well, he doesn't come to church. And I said, yeah, I know, that's why I'd like to see it. Well, this is only for people who come to church. And at 13 years old, that had an impact on my life. I remember later on in my life, when I was about 17 years old, it was my senior year in high school, and I remember uh, the beginning of that year, leading up to some other things that happened. I was in another church, and I was in the middle of this church meeting that was taking place. And the tension was so thick in this church, it had grown. God had blessed it. People had been saved. It was growing. And, and yet there was two separate groups within this church. And, and, and each one of them was kind of struggling for power within this situation. And I remember that there was a vote that night that was taking place on whether or not the church should meet at 6 o'clock on Sunday night or at 7 o'clock on Sunday night. I mean, we're talking important stuff here, right? And I remember that it passed to meet at 6 o'clock and the whole other side of the auditorium, one man stood up and said, that's not going to fly here. We're going to vote again. And then they voted again. And guess what? The 6 o'clock one again. And then we voted a third time and the 6 o'clock one again. And then the man stood up and told the pastor there saying, if you don't fix this, we're leaving the church. And that night the pastor put his Bible down. He walked out the church. He said, you're going to have to find a new pastor and you left. At 17 years old, I realized that and I saw that. And that is just two stories of many that I could share of opportunities that were wasted and on things that did not matter. And it's going to deal with something today. I remember there's been times in my church where people have said some very mean and ugly things to me or other friends of mine that are in the ministry. I often say some of the meanest people I've ever met in my life claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. Why would I start an introduction like this? Because I'd be willing to admit that maybe someone in this audience has had something like that where Christian people did something very painful or very evil. And it's one of the big reasons why people leave church. I thought about it myself. I thought about it at a time in my life, especially at 17 years old. I did leave that church. But I thought about leaving church altogether because of the things that I'd seen in my life. It goes with what we're talking about today as we continue in this series in 1 John. I want you to remember those stories I told, and then I want to kind of switch gears and lighten it up a little bit. Everybody that's ever had kids could probably relate with this next picture. Or, if you ever had any of your nieces or nephews stay the night, or you, anybody else in your family had kids and you happened to go in their house, maybe you can relate to this next image. And if you can, you can laugh out loud. <laughs> Has anybody ever stepped in a Lego in the middle of the night? Me. How many of you didn't act like a Christian when you did? I mean, no. yeah. well, it's one of the worst things in the world, right? You, you're, you're in the middle of the night, you're half awake, you're walking through the house, and one of the most painful things you'll ever experience in your life, you step on a Lego. It's so bad that Lego has even made shoes that you can buy to protect your feet. If this has not happened to you, don't ever buy your kids later. Okay. 
It's just going to happen. It's a lot of fun. Now, why, why would I start with what I started with and go with stepping on Legos? It deals with what we're talking about today. It really does, I promise. And we're going to make it all work together. We're continuing in this series through the letter of 1 John. So if you find that in your Bible or on your app, you find it near the end of the book, 1 John. And I want to kind of just reiterate some of the things we talked about very quickly because this is the third message in it, but I want to catch up if you haven't heard the first two. We started in, in chapter 1, verse 1. This is the original apostle John talking to young believers. He's saying, look, Jesus was the real deal. We lived with him. We heard him. We saw his message. We saw the things he we did. We observed what he did. We touched him with our hands. We know he was real and living, and we know he is God and he and he concern, and he gave the word of life and that life was revealed. He said we saw it and we declare it and we have seen and heard. We also declare to you. He's giving this message to these young believers and he said the reason we're doing that is so first of all you can have fellowship with us with those believers, those apostles, and indeed our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And He lays out the whole purpose of the letter of 1 John, and it is this. We're writing that these things so that your joy may be complete, or our joy may be complete. This is the beautiful thing of 1 John. As a believer, you can have, an un, you can have a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory, like the old song talks about. You can have a joy that when life crashes down on you, you still have joy for some reason. But there's something that de is dependent upon that joy. This, this letter is not talking about salvation, coming to a saving knowledge and faith in Jesus Christ. It's talking about those who have already done that. And now their fellowship within that relationship is what either builds joy in our life or we see the absence of joy as a consequence because we're not fellowshipping with God. And I want you to remember that because it's important to understand in this. We talked about the idea that 1 John talks about a next level intimacy. An intimacy that we can have with God where we're getting to know Him more and more. Where He's revealing Himself to us more through scriptures and through working in our lives. And He's giving us assurance and joy. And He's giving us this fellowship with Him. And then we talked about this next level knowledge last week when we said that when we get in the Word of God, He says that there in 1 John 2 verses 3 through 6. If you love Him, keep His commands. And if you keep His commands, that means you've got to study the Word of God. You've got to show the Word of God in your life. You live it. The word keep there in that passage means you preserve it. You protect it. It's important to you. It's like a national treasure. You don't just memorize it. You live it. And when you do that, Jesus gives us a promise throughout the Gospel of John and the letter of 1 John that He will show up and make His abode with us. That He will fellowship with us. And just like when you have an old friend you had not seen in a long time and you sit down and you drink a cup of coffee and that cup of coffee lasts hours of fellowship, right? That's the idea. We have that availability with God almost figuratively sitting at a, a table drinking a cup of coffee with God and sharing our hurts and our pain and our joys and God is just there and He's living it up, He's loving it up, and He's loving us. Isn't that exciting? That's what's missing in a lot of believers' lives. Believers' lives today, they're walking around discouraged, defeated. They're doubting if God loves them. Where's God at? And the reason why is because God never moved. They did. They got away from Him. And that sweet fellowship was interrupted. But the good news in 1 John 1, 9 says if we just, if we just repent and confess our sins, God will forgive us and we can have that fellowship restored. And when we start with that fellowship and we tell God, God, I love you, we show it. By studying His Word and living it out. And God promises that when we do that, He'll let us know Him on deeper levels. Now, I do want to clarify, He's never going to let you know something about Him that contradicts what He says in His Word. A lot of people do that. Oh, yeah, I know God and He told me this and He told me if it's contradictory to His Word, you're, 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 you're mistaken. You're mistaken. God is not contradictory with His Word. So when we do that, now let me show you another step that comes into it, and it deals with the ideas of what I started with. Today, we're going to talk about next level camaraderie. I didn't want to use that word, but it was the word that I figured would make sense with what we're going to talk about. I kind of wanted to use brotherhood, but then I didn't want the sisters getting upset, right? And I wanted to use sister, I don't want the brothers going, what's up with that, you know? And, I, I, and then I wanted to use next level love, but you're going to see as we go through this series, he talks a lot about love, but it's all in different specifications. So I, want, I thought this would be a good idea because comrades... Uh, they understand something. The word camaraderie means comradeship, good fellowship, 
brotherhood, also sisterhood. Right? Comrades in a, in, in a unit, they have one thing in common that uh, some of you military people understand this. You have one thing in common in your unit when you start out, and that is the cause that you're there. You need to survive, and you're fighting for a good cause. But as you go through time, what happens with that unit? You become a brotherhood. You become this brotherhood that is expressing concern for one another. I, I, I can still talk to my Vietnam veteran dad today, and he can look in my eyes and say he still misses that brotherhood that he had years and years ago with those fellow soldiers. This camaraderie is important. And, I, and as we understand that idea, let's jump into today's text. And I want you to say that what we're doing right now is very important. We're going to hear what the Word of God has to say. Amen? So let's open our eyes and open our ears, open our hearts and our minds to what God has to say. In 1 John chapter, uh, what should be... Uh, well, chapter 1 here tells us that this is a message. I want to, I'm sorry, I wanted to reiterate this. There's a message we heard and we declared him. This is the message. He says, God is light and there is absolutely no darkness in him. If we say we have fellowship with him, yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not telling the truth. Here's what I wanted you to share. God is light. In him there's no darkness. You have to understand that and realize that. If we say we're walking in the light as he's in the light, yet there's darkness in our life, we're lying. In other words, we can't just live for whatever we want to live for and live up life for ourselves and say we're in good, sweet fellowship with God. It doesn't work. Now, let's get into today's text. 1 John 2, 6. The one who says he remains in him, that's just synonymous with walking in the light. I'm in a good fellowship with God. The one who says he remains in him should walk how? Just as he walked. Should walk just as he walked. For those of us that are believers, something that should be going on in our life is that we walk and live our life as Jesus showed the example of how to live life. If we say that we're remaining in Him and we're not living like He is, we're lying. That is the test of our fellowship, not our relationship. Our fellowship with God. Let's move on. It says this, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command. But an old command, and I want you to understand, I'm going to explain a little bit because it kind of gets a little trickier. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you have heard from the beginning. The old command is the word you have heard. I give you a new command. Love, and this is what I want to tell you and show you what the new command is. This is what he's referring to when Jesus said in John 13, 34, 35. I give you a new command. Love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Now, let's go back to this first verse here. He says, dear friends, I'm not writing you. This is the Apostle John writing these believers. He's saying, I'm not writing anything to you. You don't already know. That's basically what he's saying. He says, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old command that you've had from the beginning. When he says the beginning there, he's talking about the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. Just like he did in John, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1, when he says, hey, I declare to you what we've had from the beginning. He's talking about when Jesus showed up and the, the, the very command that Jesus taught the early disciples. Now, several years later, John is reiterating it to these younger believers. And he's saying this, it's not a new command, it's an old command. We've been taught this since the time Jesus walked on the earth with us. And that new command was this in John 13, 34, and 35. Jesus sat down. He's, on, he's, he's with his friends, with his apostles. He says, I'm going to give you a new command. Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Why? By this, when people see the love you have for one another, they'll know you are the followers of me. That's what Jesus was saying. When I talked to that old man and said, hey, I've got this family member who's not in church. He's a believer. He's a brother in Christ. But he's caught up in sin. His fellowship's not good. We can get him to come to this group and maybe we can encourage him. And he looked at me and he said, but he doesn't come to church. He's not wanted here. This was not loving one another, was it? As Christ loved us. Jesus reiterated this. He said this in John 13. He also said in John 15 in verse 12, he says it again. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. And then he also says in verse 17 of that chapter, this is what I command you, love one another. Do you think Jesus is trying to get something across? 
Love one another. We talk a lot about love. Ryan did a great job talking about love. And sometimes we don't get, we don't truly understand what love is. But today, I hope that we'll get a glimpse of what this verse, these verses are really talking about. He says, I'm not writing a new command, but it's an old command. Jesus has taught us this all the way back to John 13. Is everybody with me? All right, let's go on in John, 1 John 2, as he keeps saying. He's, he says this now, yet I am writing you a new command. Doesn't that sound weird? John, I mean, he's he's in his 80s, and we might be saying, John, are you, are you okay? As you just said, you're not writing a new command, but an old command. But now he's saying what? Getting a little senile, John? I mean, we know you were boiled in oil and lived over it. That's a whole other story, by the way. Don't go there. But the idea is, he says, yet I am writing you a new command, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. In what, he, what John is trying to say here is, this isn't anything you haven't heard before, but the great thing about this command is, it's brand new every day. Every day. In other words, it's not some ritual passage that we learned like we did the ABCs a long time ago and we left it there or we learned some strange concept. John is saying every day when we wake up, it's a new and refreshing commandment. It has the same uh, priority and importance as it did when Jesus said it in John 13. When you wake up, you realize believers should love one another the way Jesus loved you know churches across the land would look a lot different if we really got a hold of that right if we really saw each other as comrades in the mission that god has put us in and that we really get this idea of loving each other figured out and it can be confusing and weird just like any dysfunctional family right and probably every family here is dysfunctional including mine he says, because the darkness is passing away, the true light is already shining. That idea of shining the light through loving one another. The light that we are already experiencing by fellowshipping with God. Let me give you a little warning, because this is what we will do when we hear a message like we're fixing to hear. We will hear this message and we'll think, Pastor Jeff said that if we're going to be okay with God, we have to love one another. That's not what we're going to say. What we're going to say is, you need to spend so much sweet fellowship with God that it just overflows out of you into loving your brothers and sisters. You see the difference? It's a big difference. It's a huge difference. As we move on here, look at it. He continues on. He says this, the one who says he's in the light, but look at this next word, but hates his brother or sister is in the darkness until now. We, we, we're going to park on this one here in a little bit. But I want you to get a hold of this idea. We can tell people, yeah, I'm good with God, but if you're treating your brothers and sisters in Christ without love, you, according to John, you're lying. You're not having good fellowship with God. Because if you're having sweet fellowship with God, a natural outflow is that, is that you're going to love your brothers and sisters. Well, some of these brothers and sisters are not very lovable, Pastor. I agree. Amen. I've met a lot of them. And at times, I've been one of them. Hopefully not today. Does that mean we shouldn't still love them? I want you to hold on to that question as we go on. He continues in verse 10. Look what he says here. The one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. Go back to this other verse. The one who says he does, he's in the light but hates, and the one who loves is in the light. Get the idea? The difference between hate and love and how it affects or is the outcome of the fellowship we have with God. And if we remain, the one who loves his brother or sister remains in the light, there's no cause for stumbling in them. Just like in the middle of the night, when you wake up and it's dark and you can't see what's laying on the floor and you step on a Lego, all of a sudden you realize you step into something bad, right? The difference between light and dark. We've all been there, whether it's hitting your shin on the end table, tripping over a toy, tripping over a dog or a cat, because you couldn't see. Why? Because the lights of you were in the darkness. When people are in the darkness, what do they do? They stumble around. 
It's much better when you turn the light on, isn't it? If you had your choice between a dark alley in downtown Houston and a lit up alley, which one are you going to take? Right. Who said dark alley? <laughs> I'm not going downtown with you. <laughs> uh, let's look at this word loves because here's some confusion about it. So many times we take the English language and we try to understand what the Bible is saying when our English language is kind of confusing and complex in some ways. We forget that the Bible was, uh, especially the New Testament, was written in Greek. That can, that, that they, you know, where we have one word for love and we attach that word love to everything. I love my wife and stay. Doesn't make sense, right? But what if we diminish that word love, haven't we? In Greek, you have words like phileo and you have uh, agape and you have eros and, and all these other words. And they have words that are specifically explaining what that love is for. It's great in that passage. It's great in that idea where we hear phileo. It's where we get the, the name of the city, Philadelphia. It means brotherly love. The love between uh, brothers and, the, and, and a love that can even go into relationships. It's more of a love that speaks to that. And then there's uh, eros, and we won't talk about that at church today. Because it's where we get the word Iran. Okay? So we're not going to talk a lot about that. We're not going to let your imagination go with it as you will. But it's something that married couples only, married couples only should really enjoy and become acquainted with. That's all I'll say. Erotic. There's also a agape. We're going to talk about what agape is. The action in this passage, the word love means the action of agape love. Agape love is a very important love. It's a love that is explained by God. It's attached to a godly love. It's the ultimate kind of love. It's the love that does the best for a person and does everything that a person needs even though they may not recognize it or understand it. Such as in the case in John 3.16, for God so agape the world, so love the world that he gave his only begotten son, even though the world where it was his enemies and the world had no idea where hope would come from, God gave his only son so that if they believed in him, they would not perish. This is the love of God. This is Now, when we think of the word love in our, in our thing, we think, okay, well, that's this emotional, mushy, gushy kind of love. It's the love where we're, we're just very adorable of one another. It's the love where we show extreme amounts of affection. That's not what this kind of love is wrapped up to be. This is that kind of committed, perfect love that does what's best and right and is truly sacrificial. So guys, that doesn't mean if we say we love our brothers in Christ that we have around hugging each other. Although there's nothing wrong with a good hug. But sometimes we as guys, especially, we're like, you know, it's like when we're in the prayer meeting and you know all you guys hate it when the preacher asks you, let's hold hands as we pray. And when you're forced to do it, you want to be the guy that gets the overhand, right? I don't ever want to be the guy with the underhand. I want to be the guy with the overhand, right? So I always do that real quick, you know, and then while we're praying, you want to give that extra squish just to say, yeah, I'm the awful here, you know. Yeah. All right? So you guys know what I'm talking about. That when it says that we're to love one another, it's not saying we're to have this mushy, gushy love. What it does say is that we're to love one another because of the cause of Jesus Christ, because of the commonality of Jesus Christ, because of the result of what Jesus did in our life. That's why it's rooted in our fellowship with God, not our fellowship with people. You understand what I'm saying? It's not this emotional love like we should have, more of a phileo love or one of these other loves where you would experience with your spouse or even with your children how you would love them. This is a different kind of love in that sense. It is a love that we can all express in a right way. And that's what he's talking about here. This is what Jesus said. This was a love that was introduced by God. This, this was a love that was introduced by Jesus in a world that said eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Live according to the law. Now, Jesus never broke the law. He fulfilled it. And he tells us we're to love one another. We're to do what's right for one another. That's not easy to do. This is a new love that Jesus is introducing. 
introducing. It's a love that shows forth a light. It's a light. So I want to talk about the light bulbs of love. I was going to bring up that idea, but we can all imagine a light bulb. Yeah, a light bulb. If I just put a light bulb in my hand and lit up, you'd get worried about me, right? <laughs> I'd be worried too. I'd be like, I need to leave. A light bulb shows forth light, but doesn't really produce the light. It doesn't produce light until you plug it into the source, right? The more a light, and when a light bulb is plugged into an energy source, that's when light is produced. A light bulb cannot light up by itself. When we stay plugged in, we're to be light bulbs of love. I know that sounds corny and cheesy. But we're to be light bulbs of the love of God. And when we get plugged into the source of fellowshipping with Jesus Christ, the light will shine. When we're truly fellowshipping. But the moment we unplug from that source, we're a useless light bulb that's not doing its job. Sounds a lot like last week when Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Abide in me and I'll produce fruit through Doesn't it? Our fellowship with Jesus is important. What are some light bulbs of love? What are some things that show forth when we're plugged into Jesus? And I want to hurry real quick, because I know a lot of us are tired of it. But I want to plug it, I want to show this real quick. Here's some light bulbs. Here's some examples. This is kind of a litmus test in a way where you can kind of judge yourself. Am I in fellowship? Not that I'm saved. I've trusted in Jesus Christ. That's settled. But am I in fellowship? Forgiveness. When people look at you, would they say you're a forgiving person? Or would they say that you're not forgiving? Uh, when people look at you, would they say you're a compassionate person? Would they say that you're concerned with other people more than you're concerned with yourself? Would people say, well, they're selfless. They're not, they're not stuck on themselves and selfish, but they're selfless. When people say that you're sacrificial, where you would even do without things you really want so that you can help others. When people say that you're committed to other things that are important, that express the love of God. When people say that you love people unconditionally. These are light bulbs of love, the love of God, the agape love of God. You know why that's the case? Because every one of those describe God. Don't they? Is God forgiving? Amen, right? And we should amen that. We're glad God's forgiving. Is He compassionate? Is He concerned with us? Uh, is God selfish? No. Is God sacrificial? Look at the cross. Is God committed? Does God love us unconditionally? Yes. If we live in the light, we will shine forth the light of God's love. Now listen to this next verse. But the one who hates his brother or sister is in the what? The darkness. They walk in darkness. And look what it says next. They don't know where they're going because their darkness has blinded their eyes and then they step on a leg. They don't know where they're going because they're walking in darkness. They don't know what God's will is. They're defeated. They're discouraged. They're going through this life. They're listening to people on TV and people at work. And they're trying to figure out, well, this is how I'm supposed to live my life. And yet they belong to God, but they're not fellowshipping with Him. They're not in the light. So they're walking down that dark, scary alley with no flashlight whatsoever. And they're stumbling and they're tripping. Does that sound like some Christians you know? Does it sound like you? Don't answer that out loud. But does it sound like you? That's the red light that tells us we're not fellowshipping with God. Like we we're being selfish. We're doing these things we shouldn't do. And we're blinded. We don't know what life is all about. We don't know how we're to live for God. And the reason why is just as love is light, this talks about the darkness of hate. The darkness of hate. Now, what are some obstacles of the dark? What are some of those Legos in the dark room that we'll trip over and step on that causes us pain when we're not fellowshipping with God? What are some of the obstacles of dark? It's exactly the opposite of the light bulbs of love. Are you a resentful person or bitter? Do you hold on to grudges when people do things against you? What about pride? Are you very prideful? I mean, after all, you know it all and everybody else doesn't, right? After all, you really are the one that knows how to drive on 59 and 45 and all the other idiots don't, right? Are you prideful in the sense that the way you do things is the right way? And, you, and you're prideful? Are you, are you selfish? 
Do you think of yourself first? And what I mean by that is when good things happen to other people, what's the first thought that pops in your heart? Why didn't that happen to me? Or that must be nice that they get to do that because I don't. Are you indifferent? I want you to stay here and listen. Are you indifferent? When you see people hurting or doing without, do you just kind of give them a cold shoulder? When people hurt you, when people have done something bad to you, do you avoid them and give them a cold shoulder? That's being indifferent. Are you judgmental? Are you uh, a person of vengeance? You can't wait to get them back. You just can't wait to get that revenge. Are you unforgiving? I want, and listen, what's the purpose of the message? It's not to think about other people in your life and what this applies to them. It's time for us to think of our own hearts. What does God speak saying to me? If you are any of those, and you struggle with that, now listen, we're going to fall in sin. We're not perfect, right? I get that. Well, let's not make an excuse for it either, right? If you're this, if this characterizes your life, if people in your home and people around you are honest, and we put them in a room and we said, there's no way they'll ever find out what you said. And we asked them, could you describe this person? And if they said this, it could mean that your fellowship is not where it should be. Because that's not God. Amen? It's not God. So where are you at with that? Where are you at? Look at what it says in verse 11. The one who hates his brother or sister is where? They're in the darkness. They walk in the darkness. And they don't know where they're going. Because they're blind and they cannot see. Just like when you walk in that dark house and you stumble and trip and run into things. When we're not fellowshipping in the light of God, we're walking in darkness. And our joy is not. You see, there's benefits of fellowship with God. Having that joy complete, showing that love to one another, but there's also consequences of not fellowshipping with God. It's walking in darkness. The darkness of doubt, the darkness of discouragement, the darkness of being that person that thinks they're better than everyone else. We need to walk in the light as he is in the light. As far as the church goes, I'm excited, thoroughly excited about what God's doing in our church. Look around. There's all kinds of people here. Yesterday, we came together. Friday night, some of us came together. And we worked hard. Why? Because we love, and let me talk to you young people for a second. We, this church loves you. If you didn't see that yesterday, you need to take whatever blinders off and you need to see it. This church loves you. Men who worked all day Friday all day Friday, came home, came up here after a whole work week work and stayed up here and some of them only got two hours of sleep cooking food so that y'all can go to church. The rest of the church came up here Saturday and we stood out here cooking ourselves, tired, wore out from the work week. We stayed out all day. Some stood out on the street and held a sign almost all day so people would pull in and buy the meat that people in this church bought with their own hard money, donated, cooked, so that you could go to church again. Young people, you better count your blessings here at church and love you. I don't, you know, I was a youth pastor for 12 years. I don't pull punches like that. You ought to be grateful that that many people in a church our size showed up and work themselves, and they're all here tired and sore. Just wait. When you get to be 40 or older, you'll see what's up. <laughs> I remember when I was 20 as a young pastor, I could go, you, you know, lock-ins, lock-ins. I'm, I'm, I'm like, 2 o'clock, everybody go home, sleep. You know? But I'm telling you, young people, we got a church and I'm, and i got to say, I'm so proud of our church. I really am. I know a lot of churches twice the size of us wouldn't have that many people show up. I know that. And I'm not trying to brag in that sense. Hey, I, I, I appreciate your heart. And I hope 
And here's the thing. I'm so excited about what God's doing in our church. It's up to us to defend that, isn't it? It's up to us to defend it. we got to watch out for it by doing things like Ephesians 4.32 says. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Do what? Forgive one another just as God forgave you in Christ. You, see, that's what's so important. Why is it that we love one another? It's, I, I don't love Dwayne based on what Dwayne can do for me or vice versa. We don't love one another based on, oh, well, we just had a good day and we're in a good mood so we get along. Why are we to love one another? Look what it says at the end of that. Just as Christ forgave you. Just as God forgave you in Christ. There's a story of a young man who grew up in a family and he gave nothing but problems to his family. He was always in trouble. Always in trouble. He eventually got to the point he told his parents, I hate you, I can't stand your guts, I'm leaving. And he left and went and joined the military. That's a bright idea, isn't it? Nobody there is going to tell you what to do. Right? I always laugh at those. I'm tired of my parents telling me what to do. I'm going to go join the military. Okay. See if they'll tell you what to do. <laughs> no. But he did this. He left. He lived his life. He stayed away for years. And he came to a time where he was in trouble. He ended up in prison. He did his time. He got out. He had no place to go. No job. No one else in his family was around. And all he had left was his parents. His parents were still alive. And he remembered his home address where he grew up. And he sent them a letter. He didn't even know if they still lived there or not, or if they were even alive. He sent them a letter, and he said, I'm all spent up, and I want to come home. He got on a train, boarded this train, he headed to his house, and in the letter he wrote, he said, if you, Mom, Dad, if you still want me to come home, if you're okay with me coming home, if you still love me. That big pine tree, or that big oak tree next to the train tracks by the station, if you would just tie one white ribbon around that tree, when I see it, I'll know that you want me home. If I don't see it, I'll just keep going and I'll figure it out. He says, I don't blame you for not wanting me after what I've done to you. He got on the train and he met this guy and he told him his story. As he got closer to his destination, he couldn't look out the window anymore. And he just said, I can't look. He said, just you look for me. You can, here's the tree. It's coming up. You tell me if it's there or not. And as they got closer, his, his pat, the, the co-passenger looked at him and shook him and said, hey, wait, you're not going to believe this. You need to see this. You need to see this. And as he turned, he didn't just see one ribbon, but the entire tree was full of white. He knew he was accepted. I'm telling you, in a church, it's important to tie white ribbons on trees. Like I said, I've seen some of the hardest, meanest, most evil things in churches. It should have belonged, no, but let me tell you something. It's going to be there from time to time because we're all sinners and we're going to be prideful sometimes and we're going to want our own agenda. Hey, and sometimes you husbands, you're going to get bitter against your wives because you don't think she's doing what she should be doing. And sometimes you wives, you're going to get bitter against your husbands because he's no longer the Prince Charming you thought he was. You, you children, you're going to get mad at your parents because I just don't understand. Right? <laughs> your parents, sometimes you're going to be, I'm at my wits end with these kids. <laughs> right? Sometimes siblings, you're going to get mad. Here's what I want you to remember. The reason that we're to have that sweet fellowship with God and grow in that agape love that He shows us is that when I look, if, if one of my brothers or sisters offends me, I look at them and I remember all of a sudden, God didn't just hang white ribbons on a tree. He hung His only begotten Son on a tree. And why did He do that? Because He was willing to forgive me of my sins. And if Jesus forgave me of my sins, who am I to not forgive you of yours? And the sweet thing about it is the more we spend time with God our Father, the more our hearts mold to His. And the daily assurance that we know, God, I sinned against you. I denied you. I had this thought that I shouldn't have. I lost my temper. I lied. I cut corners. I didn't do the things that I should, but God, you loved me and you forgave me. The more we bask in that light of love, the more opportunity we have to turn and share that love with our brothers and sisters. The Bible says we're to love everyone, even our enemies, by the way. 
But in this passage today, we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ. Because churches always implode. They very rarely explode. Because brothers and sisters get in each other's throats. And I'm telling you, church, we have to fight for unity and the agape love of God to be the overriding atmosphere of this place and this body. Amen? Amen. Got it. So let me wrap it up by saying a few things here. One thing we must understand, when it comes to the love of God, you must remember two things. First, experience, and then expression. And I want you to get this. When it comes to the love of God, you must remember two things. Experience and expression. What do I mean by that? Listen to what, read this, what it says up here. First of all, you cannot experience that next level camaraderie without expressing love for each other. You can't get the next level camaraderie that should exist in a church that makes the world stand back and says, wow, something is there, unless you're expressing that next level love for one another. Amen? And then you can't express next level camaraderie without experiencing the love of God. They go hand in hand. Every single day we need to fellowship and experience the love of God so we can turn around and express the love of God. But you cannot express the love of God effectively unless you're experiencing the love of God daily. Does that make sense? I want you to remember that. Here's what it is. Walking with God and walking like God means that we are to love our comrades like God loved us. But it's not this manufactured emotional, non-committal kind of love. It's the agape love of God that He fills up in our tank to overflowing and splashing out. So you've got to have that fellowship with God. And then we're to love each other the way God, the way Jesus loved us. As we stand, we're going to prepare to sing. I hope that today you know the love of God. I hope today that you're looking forward to the day when he comes back 